Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Chris Shevlin. I'm one of the product managers at Horizon Technology responsible for the Smart Prep Automated Cartridge Extractor. Today we're going to be looking at some methods in food safety and the sample preparation that goes into those methods. At the end we'll look at some applications for mycotoxins, antibiotics, and some of the food coloring dyes. When we look at the food market today, we truly do have a global food supply with imports on the rise in every country around the world. This is to meet the ever-increasing demand for food. We are seeing an increase in the demand for food worldwide because the demographics are constantly changing. We are seeing populations growing now more than ever, and those populations are becoming older. The older population is the most vulnerable to any food safety issues. Also, there is an increase in the demand for produce items specifically, where once we would see seasonal items in the grocery store, they're now available year-round. A good example of this is strawberries, where we could only get strawberries in the spring, summer in New England, we can now get them year-round. In fact, a typical grocery store would carry only about 173 different produce items in the late 80s. Today, that's more than 550 items. Another contributing factor to the increase in food demand is fact that developing nations are now moving toward prosperity. So we are seeing an increase in the amount of calories they consume daily and most diets are changing over to include meats where before they were just fruits and vegetables. As the number of food suppliers around the world increases to meet the ever increasing demand, so does the importance of food safety. We now must monitor sources from around the world to ensure our food supply is safe. The stories about contamination with toxins, heavy metals, pesticides, and other adulterants is becoming more common, and these must be defended against to ensure the population is safe. As mentioned before, there are many issues in food safety. The most common ones we see are from the pathogens, but we could also see adulteration of food from toxins, pesticides, antibiotic, toxic metals, and other types of adulterants. The importance of any analysis we do is that we have to get the result back very quickly so we know what actions to take to protect our populations. But more importantly, that answer we get back must be accurate and precise to make sure we have the right answer and take the right action. Regardless of the technique, whether it's analytical chemistry or microbiology, the key to food safety is taking adequate measurements, and these measurements must be taken before the food product is dispersed into the distribution chain to ensure the safest product. It's also very important to screen raw foods or raw materials for toxins because many of these are not destroyed or reduced during the manufacturing process of that food product. Finding the toxins before that production is going to be not only important for safety, but it will also be more economically beneficial to the food manufacturer. Also, many of the food measurements need to become more holistic or more screening based to find contaminants that may not be expected. A good example of this was the melamine and cyanuric acid found in infant formula and pet food back in 2008. Most of the screens are very targeted toward known compounds and had there been measurements taken to look for true unknowns in these food products, the public health impact could have been avoided. This is a brief overview of the analytical process. It starts with sampling. We want to make sure we get a good representative sample to be sure to catch any contaminants which may be present in our food product. Once we have that, we need to get that sample into a presentation that was suitable for instrumental analysis. This sample presentation could be some type of solid phase extraction, a liquid-liquid extraction, maybe a combination of both or some others. Once we have that sample ready, it goes into an instrument like an HPLC, an LCMS, a GC, or a GCMS, and that instrument will produce the data that we need to make the decision to determine if that food is safe or not. We're going to concentrate on the sample preparation portion of the analytical process. Many times this consists of several steps. First of all, we have to be able to get our target analyte out of the sample matrix. A lot of times that may require some type of liquid-liquid extraction, or it may be just a straight solid phase extraction to do that. 
if we're doing liquid liquid sometimes further cleanup is needed to remove additional interferences so we can actually see our target analytes if water is present sometimes we may have to dry that extract depending upon our analytical technique and many times to be able to reach our detection limits and increase sensitivity we may be have to do an evaporation or a concentration step. In fact, sample preparation tends to be one of the most difficult parts of the analytical process as it can contribute up to about 20% of the variability in the analytical process. One of the most common sample prep techniques for food materials is solid phase extraction. It's established in many markets besides just food analysis such as pharmaceuticals, it is well known in many parts of the world, in the United States, in Europe, and in Asia, and it can be used in a couple different formats. The most common are either the cartridge, which is pictured on the left-hand side in the black box, or that material can be put into a disc material. And Horizon makes instruments to be able to use both of those. So if you have a disc type of material, we have the Speedex 4790, and if you are using a cartridge, typically a 1, 3, or 6 cc cartridge, we will use a smart prep. We're going to focus now on the smart prep automated cartridge extractor. What we're doing with this instrument is we are taking what is traditionally a manual process done with a vacuum manifold and converting it to automation. It's a very good product, especially for new users. It has a very simple, intuitive software. In fact, someone who has never done solid phase extraction before can be running in a matter of hours. It has a very small footprint, which can accommodate any 1, 3, or 6 mil cartridge, and the sample sizes can range from anywhere from 1 milliliter of sample all the way up to over a liter. Some of the benefits of the instrument over the vacuum manifold is precise, consistent flow rates. This is important because it helps prevent loss of the sample, especially on loading, to break through. It will also help eliminate the risk of drying the sorbent bed out between conditioning steps and the loading steps. And the result of this is that it improves reproducibilities and recoveries. The Smart Prep also allows the user to use the current chemistry products they have in their laboratory today, so there is no real change in the method or the method procedure. When we look at where solid phase extraction, or SPE, is used today, we see that it is used across many different disciplines in analytical chemistry. Bulk of these are in pharmaceutical and hospital labs, but at 12%, it is used very widely in the food and agriculture laboratories. When we look at how SPE is used in the lab today, there are two general methods for doing solid phase extraction. The first one shown here is called capture and loop. What we're doing is we have a mixture of dyes represented by the black sample on the left. When we add that to the cartridge, all of those dyes are captured or trapped onto the cartridge chemistry. We get those different colors off by elution step one, two, and three by increasing the amount of organic solvent in each one of those elution steps. This is typical for reverse phase chemistry, although there are other chemistries that exist that have different types of retention mechanisms and different materials that will be used to elute the, the compounds of interest off of the cartridge. In this case, because it is reverse phase, we use organic solvent, typically methanol or acetonitrile, in increasing proportions to be able to get the colors off that we want, or in the food world, to be able to get the contaminants or our target analytes off the column. If we go back to our example here, we've trapped all of those colors onto the cartridge. When we add a small amount of organic, we elute the yellow, but the blue and the red are still retained. As we increase the amount of organic, the red comes off, and then finally, with the strongest organic, we're able to release the blue. The other method used in SPE is commonly referred to as sample cleanup. This is where we add our mixture to the cartridge but it is the analyte that passes through and not the interferences. The interferences will bind to the cartridge, so we just collect the pass-through of the analyte and then we inject that onto our analytical instrumentation. This is just a quick comparison of the sorbent in a cartridge compared to a solid phase extraction disc. 
we look at a cartridge, it typically has larger particles than an SPE disk has. When using an SPE disk, typically breakthrough is not an issue because the particles are a lot smaller and the larger surface area of smaller particles allows the analytes of interest to bind. However, when we look at cartridges, because the particles are larger, it is very important to control the flow rates to ensure that none of the analytes of interest go through the cartridge and are lost. Adding automation to sample prep in the laboratory can be a big step as it requires some new thinking. An investment is definitely required when adding automation to the sample prep process and sometimes this may be overlooked in the lab as we are very accustomed to adding automation to things like HPLC or GC. This was seen when auto samplers first came out for these instruments. But there are a lot of benefits to adding automation to the solid phase extraction process. Automation gives more consistent results, better reproducibility, which results in fewer reruns. And fewer reruns make the cost per sample a lot cheaper for the laboratory. Automation can also reduce solvent usage, which is a big concern of the environmental impact of the laboratory. Many laboratories have initiatives to reduce their environmental impact in the world today. Automation also improves the safety for the person who is doing the process because they are not directly exposed to so many of these harmful organic solvents. As mentioned previously, automation brings better precision and better reproducibility. Because of the larger particles in the cartridge, the flow rate is critical to make sure that all of the analytes of interest bind to the sorbent. Flow that is inconsistent especially that is if it's done too quickly it can cause the analyte to be lost upon that loading process which will result in poor precision. Also when using a vacuum manifold you can get differential pressure across the manifold. So where the valve on the manifold is located the cartridge closest to it usually has the strongest pull as opposed to the one that is the furthest away. So there's a lot of technique that goes into being able to use a vacuum manifold very precisely. A very experienced user may not have a problem with this and be able to get excellent reproducibility, but new users may find this very difficult. Automation ensures that the user's technique is not a factor in the quality of those results, and even a very inexperienced user can use the smart prep and get excellent reproducibility and precision. Here is an example of poor precision and loss of analytes from loading too quickly. The top chromatogram is a standard which has been put onto an SPE cartridge and when we load that sample we should not see any peaks coming through during our loading step. The bottom chromatogram shows the loading step injected onto an HPLC and we can see each of the six of our target analytes of interest coming through which represents about a 10% loss. The next few slides are going to look at the steps required to do solid phase extraction. Some of these will concentrate on the operation of SPE and others are going to look at the steps for method development. This is a very good visual example of solid phase extraction. So our basic steps are loading and elution. We can see the three vials here of each. One is a green dye which has been mixed manually. The other one is a pre-mixed green dye. But on both of them, we can see the loading step is the colorless clear solution, and then we are able to separate out the yellow and the blue components of that green dye. The first step in solid phase extraction is conditioning of the cartridge. What we are doing in this step is preparing the cartridge to accept the sample so our target analyte of interest actually binds to the sorbent bed. Typically, we're going to start with an organic solvent such as methanol or acetyl nitrile, and then we follow that up with a weaker solvent, which may be water or a buffer. Conditioning is important because it activates the solvent bed. We see three different pictures here, A, B, and C, of our functional groups that are bonded to the sorbent. In this case, it's the C18. And at the top, in the A picture, we are trying to condition alone with a very high polarity solvent such as water. 
What happens because of the hydrophobicity, the water is unable to get into the pores and extend the C18 groups out. And when our target analyte gets to those, there's not enough surface area for that analyte to bind. And then as we start increasing the organic solvent proportion, we can see that it starts becoming more effective until we get to that picture in C, where we now have our C18s extended and the analyte can get in there. This is typically why we will start with a very high organic because it is able to get into the pores and it has an affinity for those C18 groups and then we can follow that up with a less nonpolar solvent. Our next step is to load our sample and this is represented by the different shapes in the cartridge and this should be done at a fairly low flow rate if this is done manually, typically is recommended about one drop per second or about one to five milliliters per minute. Five milliliters per minute would be a maximum flow rate for the loading step. And then once we have all of our sample loaded, we want to do a wash step. So in a reverse phase mechanism, typically we're going to use a very small amount of organic maybe a 5 to 10 percent solution of methanol or C nitrile in water. And what this will accomplish is removing some of the additional interferences away from our analyte of interest, which will still be retained at those small amounts of organic solvent before our elution step. When we get to our elution step, the compound of interest is still bound to the sorbent on the cartridge. We want to add an eluent or a solution which will take that analyte of interest off of the cartridge. In the case of a reverse phase chemistry, that's going to be something that is highly organic, or if we are using an ion exchange chemistry, it will either be a strong acid or a strong base, depending upon the nature of our analyte. There are many items to be taken into consideration when developing a method using solid phase extraction. First thing is to classify the analytes by polarity or hydrophobicity. This will be very important in the column chemistry that we select. Also, it's important to know the charging effect of our molecule at certain pHs. pH is a very valuable tool when developing a method for a particular compound. Sometimes you can run at a very high or a very low pH and have that molecule either be neutral or charged, and depending on whether we want to do a reverse phase chemistry or an ion exchange chemistry, pH is going to become critically important. The next thing is to classify the sample and the sample matrix. Some matrices are very easy to deal with, something like uh, drinking water, it's very easy to isolate our compounds of interest, but when we get into something like spices or infant formula, it can be very difficult, so we will need a cartridge chemistry that is very specific for the analyte of interest that will wash off a lot of the interferences. The next important thing is what is the analytical technique best used for this compound of interest? If we have something that is best done by GC, we don't want to have an aqueous solution step, otherwise a solvent exchange would become necessary. We need to understand the extraction mechanism of the column chemistry for that particular analyte. And this is important when, we, when it comes to choosing the sorbent or the chemistry of the sorbent in our SPE cartridge. So we need a sorbent that gives enough selectivity that will target the analyte and give specificity for that particular analyte. We want the analyte to bind to the cartridge, and we want to have those interferences be washed away on the wash steps. So when we do the elution, we have very few compounds coming out. Ideally, it would be only the compound of interest that would come off of the cartridge. We need to have retention of that analyte on that column. If we don't have the best retention, we do run the risk of breakthrough. And in some cases, you can go to a larger sorbent bed if you are seeing breakthrough or sometimes just slowing down the overall process will help bind those analytes to that chemistry. In some cases, a different chemistry may need to be chosen. On the other side of that, it has to be ensured that the compound of interest does not irreversibly bind to the sorbent. 
if that does happen, we will get very poor recoveries because the analyte is just unable of coming off of that particular column chemistry. We need to consider the sample volume or the matrix volume. This is going to be very important in choosing the correct bed size and the correct device size or cartridge size that comes back to the 1, 3, or the 6 mil cartridge. And that will also help determine the sorbent mass. So how much sorbent are we going to use in that column? If we use too little, we may not be able to bind all of our sample. If we use too much, we may have to elute with a lot more volume than we ideally would have to, which will affect the sensitivity and the detection method, uh, detection limits of that method. Some other items that have to be considered when developing a salt phase extraction method is the size or the configuration of the device. In many cases, a cartridge is going to be the most appropriate thing to use. But if we have very small samples, something less than a mil in the microliter range, a 96 well plate or even a pipette tip chemistry device may be the best one to choose. If we have a very large sample, then we may want to look at a disk technology for solid phase extraction. And then what has to be done to that sample before solid phase extraction, because that's going to be very important. Sometimes there has to be a dilution done. There may be some sort of a pretreatment or homogenization that has to be done, or some impurities may have to be removed up front doing a liquid-liquid extraction. Also, in some cases, a hydrolysis or a derivatization may be required before doing the solid phase extraction steps. And then once the analyte or the matrix is loaded onto our column, we have to optimize our conditions, uh, such as our wash conditions, to ensure we are removing some interferences but not removing our analytes of interest. And then we want to be able to optimize the elution so we're getting the most compound off of our cartridge in the lowest volume. That way we ensure the highest sensitivity of our method. And then we have to determine how to analyze and quantitate that, which comes down to our analytical instrumentation. Verizon does have an applications library online, and there are many methods posted, which have been done in collaboration with many cartridge manufacturers, different universities, and instrument vendors, which will give you a good starting point if you want to run some of these methods in your lab today. And Horizon is always adding to these applications, and I would encourage uh, constant visits to the website to see what we have new. In the next part of the presentation, we're going to look at some applications that will run at Horizon, looking at different contaminants in food safety applications. The applications we're going to look at, the first one is in antibiotics, looking at fluoroquinolones in fish. The next one is some mycotoxin work. Finally, a look at some pesticides in wine samples. Our first application is looking at fluoroquinolones in fish samples, and this was a study done with the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Food safety and agriculture methods tend to be very complex, requiring many steps. A lot of these steps are manual steps, like grinding, liquid-liquid extraction, filtration, and in the past, the SPE and evaporation steps would also have been manual. Horizon has now automated both of those processes, and we'll show you that in this method. We specifically mapped those steps out for our fluoroquinolones application. It looks like this. We had 2 grams of fish that had to be homogenized and weighed. That took about 20 minutes. We then have spiked the fish samples with 40 microliters of our fluoroquinolones. The next step took about an hour, which was four liquid-liquid steps, followed by loading 75 milliliters of the extract, which was about two hours. And then the final evaporation step, down to six milliliters, took about 30 minutes. Verizon does have a poster outlining all of this work, and if anyone is interested, please contact us, and we would be very happy to send you a copy of this poster. When we look at the method development process of this analyte in our fish samples, it maps out looking like this. So at first, we mentioned we had to classify the analytes. Fluoroquinolones are large multi-ring compounds 
with some ACID functionality. So that gives us a couple of choices for what we can use in both the solid phase extraction cartridge and also for our chromatography column. The sample matrix, it's a solid, uh, it's high and low fat fish, which fats can be difficult to deal with. So that sample matrix has to be introduced into a format where we can get our analyte out of it and to be able to do our extractions. Looking at the analytical technique, based on the nature of the sample, it was decided that HPLC was the best chromatography technique to use and the detection technique on that would be fluorescence. One of the benefits of fluoroquinolones is they do fluoresce and fluorescence gives very nice uh, sensitivity with uh, very low background. And then if we look at the extraction mechanism, we had two choices because it is lar a large multi-ring compound. Sometimes a phenyl type chemistry might work or since it has an acid chemistry, it was decided to go with the cation exchanger. It was actually the strata from Phenomenex. When looking at the sample size, two grams was decided to be used based on previous methods. And because of the amount of sample that we had post-liquid-liquid, -liquid, we chose a sorbent mass of 500 milligrams and a 3cc cartridge. And then once we got down to that, we had to optim optimize the SPE method development. On the SMART prep, one of the big benefits is that we are able to collect the loading step, the wash steps, and multiple fractions on the elution. So we know where our com compounds are coming out and if we're getting them all efficiently in one of those steps, most, like, most notably the elution step, we want to be able to elute with the lowest amount of volume to keep the highest amount of sensitivity. Now if you had this method manually, you can also just convert it over to the smart prep in the software. The four fluoroquinolone molecules are shown on the left here. All are very structurally similar, and they are all aromatic amines with a carboxylic acid end and a fluorine group. So typically this molecule is going to be zuterionic, which tends to be difficult to work with. It turned out the strata cation exchange columns work the best, which is based on a sulfonate group which attaches to the positively charged nitrogen. It is then eluted at a high pH. This slide shows a nice overview of the entire preparation process. On the left hand side we have all the conditions used for the liquid-liquid extraction procedure. And then on the right hand side it shows the solid phase extraction procedure using the Strata XLC. So the results show very nice improvement over the current FDA method for fluoroquinolones. We get a little bit better linearity. Our recovery limit goes up from 60% to 87%. The original FDA method did not publish a high recovery limit, but on the Smart Prep cartridge extractor, we're able to get below 130%. And then the biggest improvement is in the reproducibility, where the percent RSD of the FDA method has to be less than 20%. The newly adapted method onto Smart Prep came out to be less than 4%. So we can see here how automation really does bring value to the reproducibility of the solid phase extraction process. This slide gives us more details into our results. You can see on the bottom we have all four of our fluoroquinolones and we get adequate resolution between all four of those peaks in about five minutes. The total runtime in this was about seven minutes with the re-equilibration we also have our recoveries none higher than 130%, and we get excellent reproducibility of the method with our highest percent RSD is the enrofloxacin in high fat fish at just under 4%. The next application we're going to look at is deoxynevalanol or vomitoxin in wheat. And once again, this study was done with the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Typically, any of the mycotoxins or aflatoxins are done with immune affinity cartridges. 
one of the benefits of this chemistry is that it's very selective for the toxin that is of interest because it's based on a antibody receptor binding. One of the challenges to these chemistries is that they can be difficult to use and difficult to train someone on. The gel sorbent in each of the cartridges must remain wet. If it goes dry, the cartridge is no longer viable and has to be repeated. The compound deoxynivalenol, also referred to as pomatoxin, exists in raw agriculture crops and it can be carried through to processed foods. The material test in this was a shredded wheat cereal, spiked at 200 micrograms per kilogram, and the EU criteria for recovery is 60 to 120 percent for those spiked levels. The point of this study was to compare also two different cartridges, the traditional immunoaffinity based cartridges to see if those could be converted over to the smart prep instrument but we also looked at more of a traditional sorbent-based chemistry called the Sepeltox SPE cartridge. This is a cartridge for mycotoxins, which is more like a solid resin. And looking at these two different cartridges, there was only about a 2.6% difference in the recovery. So the automation has really brought a valuable piece to be able to use either one of these chemistries. Once again, Horizon does have a very nice poster detailing all of this work. And if there is any interest in this, please contact us and we will be sure to give you a copy. When comparing automated versus manual samples, we can see that in both chromatograms we get excellent isolation of the peak. The peak of interest is at about four minutes on the left hand side of the chromatogram labeled deoxynivalenol. Both methods did meet the acceptance criteria of the 60 to 120 percent is per the EU and the material we're looking at here is wheat germ which is a moderately processed food commodity but this shows why it's important to check for these toxins throughout the entire processing where if we have unprocessed wheat berries and this is present even with all of the processing the toxin is not destroyed or converted to something else One of the other tools we can use along with Smart Prep for processing these samples is after solid phase extraction, we use a Horizon instrument called the ExcelVap to evaporate off our solvent. The basic steps are shown here where we load and collect two milliliters of the sample. We then elute with four milliliters of acetonitrile water, 84% acetonitrile, 16% water. We do that twice, so we have about 10 mils of sample because we're collecting the initial loading step as well and then we evaporate everything down so it's about 10 milliliters of sample we evaporate that fraction down to dryness and then we reconstitute with a solvent that has more aqueous so it can be injected onto an HPLC. This chart shows a nice comparison between doing samples manually. The manual samples are in red to the right hand side of the chart at a spike level of 200 micrograms per kilogram. We also did this automated with the smart prep at two levels, 1,000 and 200 micrograms per kilogram. And for the 1,000 microgram per kilogram samples, we did three and four replicates depending on the commodity. And you can see in blue, we have excellent recoveries and excellent reproducibility on all of those different types of samples that have different levels of processing. Now if we compare the yellow and the red, we get better recoveries and more consistent recoveries than what we see with manual SPE. There are two commodities which have a star on them, the wheat germ and the shredded wheat cereal. And what happened on those, we have recoveries in the manual method of 103 and 71.2. We actually experienced some of the acetonitrile being evaporated during the vacuum manifold while we did the, the manual process. This shows that we have results that are falsely inflated and we get more consistent results when using automation. We're now going to look at aflatoxins in foods, looking at different food materials. This work was also done at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. 
Horizon does have a very nice poster on this, and again, if you would look a reprint of this, please contact us, and we will very be very happy to get one out to you. This method again compares an automated method versus a manual method for looking at samples with different viscosities and different moisture levels. So for example, something that has very low moisture content but a very high viscosity is something like peanut paste, where something with a very low viscosity and low moisture may be something like a curry powder. And dealing with each type of matrix can be very challenging. The EU spike recovery levels on this is 70 to 110 percent for recoveries and a 20 percent RSD would be considered acceptable. And we did have a very new technician do this and the results do show the concentration effect from the evaporation of the acetonide trial. So this starts with a liquid-liquid extraction that's then loaded and two mils of filter sa a filtered sample is put onto the solid phase extraction cartridge. Caribidization is required to do the analysis on this after the extraction. And some of the common derivatization methods are something called a FRED, which is a post-common photochemical reaction, or there is an AOAC method which uses iodine and a reaction coil. Anything done post-column where you're adding in additional reagents will cause the dilution of your sample, which will affect your limits of uh, detection and sensitivity. One of the additional or one of the new ways of doing this, which is very easy and efficient, is again using the ExcelVap, which is our evaporator. Since the evaporator does use a water bath, it has been found that a moist heat and a dark environment will cause the derivatization of the aflatoxins B1, B2, G1, and G2. And our results showed very good linearity of greater than two nines over seven points. The final application we're going to look at today is the pesticides in wine, and what we really want to show in this is the method conversion from a manual method to an automated method. As you've seen with the other work that's been published here, we do have a poster on this, and if anyone wants a copy of this, please contact Horizon. We will get you a copy of this poster. When we look at the actual method conversion for this, you can see very little has changed. It's the same sorbent chemistry, the Oasis HLB, and we are using the same solvents. The only thing that has changed are some of the proportions and some of the rates and times. So just to highlight some of these changes, the original sample done manually is pulled through by gravity, where we can simply use an automated method to do this at 5 mils per minute. We were able to cut the air drying time down because there is some pressure behind that by five minutes. We did our final elution with 50-50 ethyl acetate hexane instead of the original 2080. And then when it came to the evaporation step, we and since we have the ExcelVap, which is a, a, an automated evaporator, uh, we can do that down to one mil, which uses 60 degree water bath using a nozzle of nitrogen. On the original one, it's an evaporation of nitrogen down to 0.1 mils, and then you have to add in 1 mil of 0.1% corn oil and ethyl acetate. So that step is able to be skipped altogether by using the Excel app. And then the analysis done by GCMS. So in conclusion, food safety continues to make the news. Measurements are the most important part to ensure that we have a, a safe food supply and solid phase extraction is a very good technique used for concentrating or cleaning up our analytes of interest. SB has been out there for a long time using manual methods, but the addition of automation can definitely improve the performance. It gives less uh, hands-on time. It allows inexperienced technicians to be able to run and it improves the reproducibility and the precision of the process. We'd like to thank you for attending today. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to contact Horizon and someone will get back to you. Thank you again.